Breaking news, the Washington Post has just obtained a draft of a report that has been prepared for the Senate about Russia's interference in our 2016 election, and it describes it as the most sweeping analysis yet of Russia's disinformation campaign. The report studied the millions of social media posts provided by technology firms, and here's what it found, according to the paper, that Russia used every major social media platform to help elect Trump, that all of Moscow's messaging was intended to benefit the Republican Party, specifically Trump, and that on Facebook alone, Russia's campaign reached 126 million people. It reached another 20 million people on Instagram. With us now, one of the Washington Post reporters that obtained this report and is breaking this news, Craig Timberg, and our chief media correspondent, Brian Stelter. Craig, how is any of this different from what we've already learned about Russian interference? Let's start there. This in many ways is the report we've been waiting for. It's sweeping, it's comprehensive, it uses the fullest data set we've seen yet from the companies who turned over lots of information to the government that they didn't turn over to anybody else. And so this is, a, this is it doesn't exactly tell us things we didn't suspect or haven't heard, but it puts it all together in a new way and it's very comprehensive and compelling. I feel like they kind of reverse engineered the entire Russian dis disinformation campaign in this one report. In your report, you write that this report found the Russians, quote, worked even harder to support Trump while in office. While in office, how so? Every platform that these researchers tracked posted, posted more often after the election. YouTube in particular went up uh, by some remarkable degree. And so we, you know, we tend to think of this narrative in terms of you know, coming up to election day, but actually intensified after election day. And we're still intensifying when the social media companies took this data, d took these accounts down from the internet uh, research agency in Russia some, sometime around the middle of 2017. Now, this Russian campaign, as you mentioned, Brian, reached 126 million people on Facebook, another 20 million on Instagram. Is that a lot in the world of social media? Yeah, on, on websites where there are billions of accounts, uh, 100 plus million is, is a very big number. It doesn't mean that every person who, who viewed this content was manipulated or persuaded by it. But obviously, the Russians didn't need to persuade 100 million people. They only needed to persuade a relatively small number of people in order to affect the outcome of the election. Now, whether that is what actually happened or not, I don't think we will ever be able to say for sure. But with all the talk lately about who knew what when, new uh, elements about collusion, new uh, claims about the Mueller probe, this takes us back to what really happened and just how concerted the Russian effort was to try to persuade voters. And, and like I said, it didn't take 100 million people to be persuaded. What happened because of these Russian trolls, these hackers and criminals, is that it changed the conversation around the election. Mm -hmm. And I think most importantly, Anna, as you pointed out, this reporting uh, from these researchers is that it ramped up even more intensely after election day that makes you think about Trump's relationship with Russia Trump's relationship with Putin after election day in the early days of the presidency and what was going on why were these Russian agents still trying to affect Americans thinking one of the details Craig in this report is that it found that Russians targeted um, African Americans specifically with misleading information about how to vote tell us more about that well one of the major parts of this campaign uh, which was keeping people from going to the ballot box, people who would have voted for Hillary Clinton, at least in the view of the Russians, apparently. And so there was all this messaging around, hey, you know, we can't trust elections, or Hillary Clinton isn't any better than Donald Trump. And we've known that for a while, but to see it put together in a single comprehensive report is really impressive. And it looks like the effort to reach African Americans was nearly as extensive and as effective as the effort to get conservatives activated around gun rights or around immigration issues. So really, they worked both sides of the of the coin, if you will, really effectively. And right. some of it was about promoting conservatives and encouraging people to vote for Trump. Others was about discouraging voting for Clinton. But all of it was in the same direction, right? All of it was in the Trump right. direction, even though they were, they were pressing different buttons for different people. Craig, does this report reach any conclusion as to how this may have impacted the election? It does not wrestle with that question. And of course, on some level, it's unanswerable, right? There's no way yeah. we can go and run the election again and take this out right. and see what happened. But it does suggest that the campaign was, was really shrewd, uh, was sophisticated in its understanding of American politics, was, was sustained, uh, and, was, and, and kept going even longer than most of us really understood. And in fact, there's no reason to think this ended in 2017. I mean, the social media companies, Facebook and such, were still taking down a, a, you know, accounts affiliated with this, you know, right up until the, almost to the midterm election. Now, this report doesn't reveal what happened with that kind of data, but there's no reason to think the Russians stopped. I mean, why would they?
Let me read just a mm. quote here. It says, social media have gone from being the natural infrastructure for sharing collective grievances and coordinating civic engagement to being a computational tool for social control, manipulated by canny political consultants and available to politicians and democracies and dictatorships alike, Brian. Right, and that applies to more than just Russia, uh, more than just one foreign government. It happens to be Russia uh, that is the, the central focus of this probe. But other foreign actors, other groups are also able to use social media in this way. And Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, Google, they have belatedly woken up to these facts way too late. Our colleague Donio O'Sullivan has some new reporting uh, that suggests maybe these researchers were only given the bare minimum of help from the social tech, uh, social networks. Now, we'll have to see what the networks say. Facebook may say that it was enormously helpful to these researchers, but that's been a concern for the past couple of years. How open have Facebook and Twitter been to letting us reconstruct what went wrong in 2016 and what might still be going wrong today? Because I think as any user of Facebook or Twitter knows, there's been some changes, there's been some improvements in some ways, but it's pretty easy to go down a pretty dark rabbit hole and find a lot of nasty content on social media these days. Some of it just published by Americans, but some of it published by people pretending to be Americans. And that's the root of this report. That's the root of this problem. People that are posing as Americans trying to sow division in our country. And, and Craig, as we point out, again, this report suggests that Russians didn't stop once Trump is in office. Do we have any indication if they're doing it right now? Look, there's every reason to believe that they are, but there's also a lot of reason to believe that they got more sophisticated. So right. as Brian points out, the researchers do, in the report, do take issue with how the social media companies handled the request by the government. Google in particular comes in for criticism for not being more open with its data around how YouTube was used. Uh, there's some fairly pointed language about that. Uh, mm. and, but it's also true that the companies are doing more now and it's also true that the, that the Russians and others are presumably getting more sophisticated all the time. A lot of this, you know, the, the ads on Facebook were paid for in rubles, right? The internet addresses were in St. Petersburg, Russia. They, it almost feels like the, the Russians weren't trying very hard to cover their tracks back in 2016. <laughs> I think there's every reason to believe they're better at this now, and there's every reason to believe that it's still going on. And it's not something you can fix. It's only something you can manage. It's like a chronic condition. It's like diabetes. It's something you have to constantly be on top of and manage. And the question is whether these companies that really manage our digital lives are able to manage this misinformation problem. That's still an open question. Brian Stalter, Craig, thank you both.